Well, I'm sitting here today with uh, Freddy Silva uh, above Sintra, Portugal, uh, in the woods behind uh, Penna Castle. And uh, we have been looking at uh, uh, Templar sites. Now, I've always assumed that the Templars were in Jerusalem, uh, in the Holy Land, uh, in France. Mm -hmm. What were they doing here in Portugal? <laughs> uh, that's exactly what I asked myself. Um, and it's, and it's, a, it's a very good point because most people associate the Templars with the Crusaders. Not quite the same thing. Uh, the two are very, very different people, even though the members that, uh, of the future Templars did go there at the same time as the Crusades. Um, the story is actually very intricate. Uh, it's an intricate, intricate web of uh, family connections, uh, business connections, uh, religious connections. And uh, it uh, really dates back to a time when uh, Godfrey de Bouillon, who became the first king of Jerusalem, uh, once the city has been completely uh, uh, rid of all the Arabs, uh, they established their uh, positions as military people do. And then he does something very strange. He walks outside the city gates, still roaming around with uh, Arabs, quite, uh, quite annoyed because they just lost their strong point. And he does something very silly for a military man. He goes outside the gates, goes to the ruins of the Basilica on Mount Sion, where there used to be uh, many, many temples, including one by, uh, for the Essenes. And he sets up this mysterious, or, uh, mysterious order of monks and cavaliers called the Order of Notre Dame of Sion, otherwise known as the Order of Sion, a uh, real organization. And it really is central to understanding of how the Templars came to be involved here in Portugal, because uh, one of the, uh, the, the first count of the county of Portugal, which is uh, the predecessor of Portugal, tiny little county in the north, north of here. Um, he sails to Jerusalem twice, and on one of his trips, he takes a young man with him called um, Pierre Arnold de, de la Roche, otherwise known to the locals here as Arnaldo de Rocha, who then appears about a decade later as the head or the prior of the Order of Simon. Now, he's the central culprit in this story of how the Templars ended up in Portugal because we have documents now showing that he, along with four other Templar preceptors, are ordered by the then Grand Master Hugh de Payon to travel back to Portugal in 1125 to establish, and I quote, a Portuguese crown. So we have here, at the very, very early stages in Jerusalem, the players in the uh, story of Portugal, as it would become, the central characters that would form the nucleus of the Knights Templar in Jerusalem, and the Knights who were ordered by the Grand Master to come from Jerusalem to this little county to establish a kingdom within a kingdom accountable only to God. So the Portuguese kingdom was established by the Templars? Uh, absolutely. And uh, we have it right from the horse's mouth that the Hugh de Pion himself did actually order four preceptors, Templar preceptors, to go from Jerusalem. Uh, one is the uh, head of the Order of uh, Sion as well, to boot. And uh, they basically landed north of here and uh, it, they already had contacts within the city of Braga. And uh, from those contacts and uh, through their Burgundian connections in the country, they began to establish uh, preceptories. Uh, they were given properties, land, uh, homes to live in. And slowly you see this intricate le uh, web of uh, relationships starting to pay dividends after two decades. And before you know it, they've got title deeds here and they're acquiring more property in the county of Portugal long before they did in France. So we have always thought that, and they were, t and were told that the Templars were in Jerusalem to predict pilgrims <laughs> who were going to Jerusalem and that seems to have nothing to do with Portugal. Absolutely nothing. Uh, it's, 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 it's something that just hasn't been written in history. Uh, it's been completely forgotten. It's like it's marginalized. It's something that is a footnote in history. Uh, but the documentation is all there and of course we know now today that the entire concept of nine nights patrolling 33 miles Seems a little ludicrous, to actually. Jaffa to Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, that's a superhuman feat. Uh, apart from the fact that uh, there is proof and evidence that the Knights Hospitallers were already policing the roads by themselves. In fact, there's not even a shred of evidence that shows the original core of the Knights Templar did any fighting at all. There were two brotherhoods, an outer brotherhood, who took care of temporal matters, such as fighting, as you had to do. Uh, even monks had to uh, take up a sword once in a while. And then there was the Inner Brotherhood, who did, uh, they looked like they were being guided by a ministerial college. They were doing things of a very spiritual nature, and mm -hmm. we find the same thing here as well.
So they must have had some intent and purpose, uh, which was not the external intent exactly. of protecting pilgrims. What was that? Well, the idea uh, for that really has to do with the uh, um, benefactor of the uh, Templars, who is the uh, monk Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, he creates, uh, he's, he's the highest member of the Cistercian order in France. And if you start reading his letters and his credo, you begin to get a sense that this guy was looking all the way from the beginning to create a kingdom of conscience separate from the Catholic Church. A kingdom of conscience. Accountable only to God, to nobody ah. but God. I see. And almost in a non-religious or early Celtic Christian sense. And when you start looking at the heritage of the original, uh, not nine knights, but eleven knights, there were actually eleven, if we look carefully at some of the, the transcripts. Um, so even there we have a problem with history. Um, it's quite clear that most of the Templars were actually handpicked by Bernard of Clairvaux, and they were Cistercian monks, mm -hmm. two of whom were actually Portuguese. Uh -huh. That changes things considerably. So Portugal was going to be the center of this kingdom of conscience. Oh, even better than that. Uh, when the young prince uh, of Portugal was aided by Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, I have a document that also states quite clearly that the Templars, after his father died, always came to his aid and didn't stop doing it until he was king mm. and long after. Mm -hmm. So his father, who'd gone to Jerusalem, obviously made some good connections. When he died abruptly in 1111, sorry, 1113, the young prince was only eight years of age, and the Templars supported him, made sure that he was brought up in the Templar tradition. And by the time that he grows up to be, uh, to be crowned a knight at 16 years of age, uh, kids had to grow up very quickly back mm -hmm. then, uh, he's actually crowned as a knight Templar as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, they helped him essentially establish a, a stronghold against the Spanish, who were then trying to uh, rule the country. So what we then find is that uh, Afonso, the king, slowly takes the country away from the uh, Spanish and from the Moors, who are uh, ruling his uh, piece of land. And then, uh, once he's established all the uh, land all the way down to the River Tejo, he then does an incredible thing. He gives away a third of his territory to the Knights Templar. And that's the big story here, because mm. it was a long, patient plan, waiting 40 years for these things to happen. And once they had that title deed, they took up one third of the country, mm. and the center of which was the town of Tumar, where their most important monuments are to this day. Mm -hmm. That was the center of their kingdom of conscience. Uh, and we visited oh, uh, did. This, uh, this little town, which uh, uh, is quite an interesting little town. Oh, surreal. Yes. Uh, and, and there is evidence pretty clear evidence all over everywhere of symbols yeah. from, the, from the Templars. What's curious to me is then the connection with this to Jerusalem. Was it simply an accident of history that the, the Crusades happened to be going on at this same time? Uh, oh, why would you so. need to have Jerusalem connected to a kingdom that's here in Portugal? Yeah, I mean, it was very opportunistic uh, of them. I mean, they found the right moment in history where suddenly a confluence of events took place, where it allowed a huge army to march through Europe, uh, most of which died on the, along the way. Yes. And so you had this favorable moment for the first, I mean, hundreds of years where you have a large body of men marching on Jerusalem, reestablishing the, the Christian uh, sacred places, which this particular group of Arabs had denied the Christians for the last 180 years, whereas the Arabs in Fordham did allow worship in the sacred sites. So there are Arabs and there are other Arabs within mm. the Arab kingdom. And we have to remember it's a very complex story. Uh, and the connection between Tumar and Jerusalem was, again, going back to the ties that bind the, the Cistercians, who were basically supporting the Templars uh, spiritually and also in terms of uh, logistical matters, because Bernard of Clairvaux had deep fingers into the pies of the Vatican. He was a great uh, the diplomat and was able to even install his own Pope, who was favorable to the Cistercians. Uh, we have some of the Templar Knights who were very rich barons and Burgundians and part of a, a holy bloodline of Europe at the time. And then you had the Order of Sion, a very mysterious order of which we know so little about because so little has been uh, information is, is, uh, remains about them. Uh, so you have these three people uh, who come together in Jerusalem, they go away, they go back to Portugal, they create the kingdom, they set up the uh, Templar Preceptory in Tumara, and through a, an extraordinary piece of design, they align their main church with John the Baptist to their main rotunda, and through a curious design uh, of symbols in this church, 
you can align straight back to the Order of Sion in Jerusalem. Mm. So they're, te they're making a point. They're mm -hmm. saying that these things are related. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you actually do the uh, connection between Jerusalem, Tumar, and Roslyn, or should I say Temple, which is the town next to Roslyn, where they also had their first preceptor in uh, Scotland, you form a perfect equilateral triangle. And we're talking something that spans over two and a half thousand miles. Mm. So they're doing the old system of locating sacred sites by the use of triangulation. Mm. So in some sense, they were setting up this kingdom in an isolated place, mm. because Portugal would, would have been an isolated place oh, totally. uh, in, yeah. in Europe. Uh, and it was really the center of the whole operation. It was part of a, a triple, like a trinity. Ah. Uh, it eventually did become the center of the, the Templar operation by default when they basically were rounded up in 1309. It, everybody did move here that wasn't rounded up uh, during the, the uh, night of October the 13th. The others moved to Roslyn and Kilmartin in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And these two people in Portugal and Scotland still maintain their contact, uh, and that's documented too. So eventually, it did become the center of their world, whether they knew it or not, and whether it was designed or not is another matter, but certainly it did become the focus of their overseas development and expansion, uh, and, it had been, and it has been so for the last four, 400 years. Uh, they're the ones who started off the connections to, the, uh, to the Newfoundland, Labrador, the voyages to Nova Scotia, and the rest, of course, is history, mm. because then we start getting involved with the progeny of the Templars, the Masons, who then become the founding fathers of America. So mm. they were always looking to the West once they lost the ability to, con to uh, do what they were doing in uh, Europe, mostly because of uh, the shenanigans of Philip, the King of France, and uh, the Pope. Mm -hmm. One wanted uh, to get into the order, but was too corrupt to be allowed in, so he concocted these ludicrous uh, th uh, charges against them. And I think the he also owned, uh, owed them money. A lot of money. Yes. <laughs> that, get, that clears a lot of slates. You know, just kill them, that's it. And the Pope, of course, uh, was kind of uh, incensed that the Templars were teaching people uh, spiritual self-development. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a given. Uh, there's so much evidence to support that they were performing the uh, a ritual, an ancient Egyptian ritual called the uh, Raising of the Dead. Uh, to cut a long story short, essentially, uh, these esoteric orders, of which the Templars uh, were one, they claimed all along that people who were just walking every single day, minding their own business, they're spiritually unaware. They are like the walking dead. But once you come into contact with this inner brotherhood of people, much like the Assems uh, or the, um, um, uh, the people in the Languedoc, the Cathars, uh, the Bogomils of Bulgaria, all of these sects basically understood that once you come into contact with the deeper mysteries of life and you understand how the universe works, uh, you are then risen from the dead. And it's a practice that takes about three years to achieve. But even today, the uh, Masonic principle, the third degree, the candidate mm -hmm. is raised from a figurative yes. grave by a handshake where mm -hmm. he is risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that's where he's finally given the secrets of life. We've just been visiting this castle, which is a kind of 19th century... Uh, uh, whimsy. Whimsy. <laughs> I wanted to say folly, but <laughs> uh, whimsy will do. Uh, and yet, Within all of the symbolism that is just rife throughout this castle, and every kind of symbolism, 19th century, uh, they were picking up on uh, Arabs and every, every culture, uh, but th buried in here are still Templar symbols. Yeah. Does that mean that there was a connection, even in the 19th century, Oh, absolutely. To the Templars. Absolutely. I mean, they, uh, their sphere of influence really went downhill a little bit um, after the, uh, the Inquisition and the, the Pope rounded them all up. Uh, they fled uh, to Scotland and Portugal. They were given safe passage. And they basically went on hiatus for six years once the Inquisition shows up. Uh, the King of Portugal, who was himself very closely allied to the Templars, we don't know how yet, uh, but he certainly was uh, totally behind them. And he said, well, look, uh, that the Pope has asked me to get rid of the Templars, so let's get rid of the Templars. You guys make yourselves scarce. Go to the Algarve, take six years off, have a holiday, and when you come back, you'll be called something else. And it's one of the biggest practical jokes ever played in, in, in history, where the Pope has given this letter saying that the Ty Knights Templar no longer exist. But uh, in the meantime, we have come up with a new uh, group of cavaliers called the Order of the Knights of Christ. Is that okay with you? Ah, sure, that's fine. 
same people. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, the land was given back to them, the money was given back to them, and they went on doing what they were doing for at least 300 years uh, with to total uh, immunity. And uh, even the King uh, Manuel of Portugal, he was also a Grand Master of the Order of Christ, and that's when the maritime expansion really grew out of proportion. Uh, Henry the Navigator, who was also a Templar Master and the head of the Order of Sion as well, so he had a dual role. All of these people were working within this kingdom of conscience, totally free, and uh, behind the, the backs of the, uh, the Pope. But then, of course, you know, they accumulated a lot of wealth, a lot of power, and that drew in a lot of unpleasant people. And, of course, the whole system, again, starts to corrupt. corrupt. Yet again, mm -hmm. we have kings coming into Portugal who don't quite understand that they want to get in on this uh, act. And, of course, they can't. They don't have the spiritual degree that they, that, that they should have. So then we see a seesaw of events, and by the uh, late 19th century, we have, you know, Ferdinand, uh, the, the, one of the last Portuguese kings who comes here to Sintra, and he starts bringing back those concepts of Rosicrucianism, of Freemasonry, of the Templars, and you see at Pena a lot of the symbols that he uh, put up yet again, just as if the 16th century had never stopped. So he was trying to bring back, and he was quite obvious about it, he wasn't even being subtle. Mm -hmm. He was showing quite clearly the way he positioned his symbols that he meant for the uh, for things to come back and he had a degree of success until of course the church and the events the revolution against the monarchy took uh, all that away from him mm. and the rest is history well we're going to have to get out of here before it rains uh, it but, doesn't need to rain uh, if uh, our viewers would like to follow up on this uh, I suspect you'd like to tell them about a book you've written oh I think I could tell them that <laughs> Um, there is a wonderful book. It's about Yathic. Uh, it's going to fry your brain. Um, it has 800 references, so you can always check up exactly where this information came from. You don't take my word for it. Uh, it's called First Templar Nation, and it's literally the story of how of the creation of Europe's first nation state, uh, which again is a very important part of the story. That they didn't just create Portugal as a country; it was Europe's first nation state. So that's very, very historic and very deliberate. Uh, as a statement, so you can go to uh, invisibletemple.com and check that out. And it's also available in electronic form. Absolutely. So uh, check it out.